Okay, I've been asked to go through how to do the calculations for forensic entomology on uh, Excel for you, uh, simply because this is by far, at least according to me, the easiest way to do this type of calculation. Um, I've tried to do these types of calculations by hand, and that can just turn into a nightmare if there's a simple mistake somewhere. And since I do make quite a few mistakes, I want you to know the way that I do it so that you can do it a little more easily. All right, so this is how I do my basic calculations. You should be given a certain amount of information depending on which assignment you're on or what you're doing or whatever else. Uh, there's a couple of things that you can do. The first thing you should be getting is you should get something that looks like this or a life table. Now, depending on what part you're on, I might give this to you. Uh, this is uh, in probably in this form where it's just a table with the name of the species on one side, the uh, stages on the top and how many hours it was it took for those species to go through their uh, development. If you are in a little more advanced uh, aspect of this, you might have to look up this information on your own. So if you are, say, doing your own research or something like that, or doing an assignment where I'm asking you to upload this or, or, or to find this information, you'll have to go to a paper. So those papers uh, you can go and look up elsewhere. But no matter what, you're going to get a life table like this. It'll have the species. It'll have how many hours it took those species to go through their development. Now, in these life tables, uh, not only do you need the number of hours, you need two bits of information. One, you'll need to see what uh, temperature these species were kept at during development. And two, you need the threshold temperature. For the most part, if I am giving you this information in this form, you will see this information down here. So you will see all species kept at 25 degrees Celsius and the threshold temperature. If you are trying to look up a new species, you'll have to go and find that information somewhere. Okay, so you're going to have it. All right, now let's go through how I do the calculations. So first and foremost, here's some new data. Uh, this is a little different from what you're going to be seeing on your assignments. Uh, I uh, want to make sure that you actually practice with uh, the information that you see on your assignments. So this is the type of data. Let's say I've got Chrysomyia megacephala. This is a species of fly. This is the life table for Chrysomyia megacephala. So you can see here it's got the species. It takes, uh, this is all in hours. So it takes megacephala 10 hours to go through the egg stage, 12 for the first instar, 22 for the second, 45 for the third, 36 for the prepupal stage, and 98 for the pupae stage. Now they were reared at 21 degrees Celsius uh, with a threshold of six degrees Celsius. So that threshold, remember, is something that is experimentally determined. So this I usually just give to you. So this is their basic threshold. So what I need to do is I need to start with uh, step one. Step one for figuring all this stuff out is to figure out how many degree hours it takes these uh, species to go through each one of their life stages. So figure out your degree hours first. Okay, now this is a pretty straightforward process and I like to do this on a spreadsheet like this. Okay, so this is what we're looking at here. Uh, you can see, let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, so I have to label everything. I don't know about you, but I forget almost immediately once I've written something down exactly what it means. It is really difficult to try to go back and figure this out after the fact. That can take a lot of extra time. So I recommend putting labels in or do whatever works best for you. So I will always start out with the species name up here. So in this case, it's going to be Chrysomyia, Chrysomyia megacephala. Okay, so I just put that at the top there. And a little bit of housekeeping. Okay, then I put in the, uh, the stage and the temperature. So this is the temperature that it was reared at. So this is 25 degrees Celsius in C. And then I put the egg stage or the stages at the top here. So that's the egg stage. This is the um, first instar, second instar, third instar, pre-pupae, and pupae. Okay, 
So there's my full stage. Now I need to transfer this information from this given life uh, table over here. So at 25 degrees Celsius, I should put in hours. Okay, 25 degrees Celsius, it takes 10 hours to go through the egg stage. So that's from being freshly laid all the way to hatching into the first instar. Set, the first instar takes 12 hours. The second instar takes 22. The third instar takes 45. The pre-pupil stage, let's see here, takes 36. And the final pupil stage takes 98. So this is all in hours. Now this is just literally copied from that information that was given you. So all of this is good. Now at the top, I do like putting the uh, threshold just so I have it um, up there in case I need it really quick. Okay. So all of this should be very simple because you're just copying. Now is when we get into the calculation portion of things. So in this case, what I'm trying to do is figure out the accumulated or the degree hours. So DH is degree hours that is necessary for these organisms to make it through each one of these stages. What's neat about insects is that they need a standard set of degree days or degree hours to go through each one of these stages. So it doesn't matter what the temperature is outside. They still need to have the same degree hours or degree days. If it's really warm, they're going to get through those degree hours or degree days degree days much more quickly. If it's really cold, it's going to take them longer. So they still need to get through it. Just how long it takes them in time is uh, dependent on the temperature. So you can kind of think about this like, uh, let's say you've got homework for this class. You know, I'm requiring that you read three chapters. If you are really fast at reading or you're super energetic or something like that, it's going to take you way less time to read those three chapters than if it's late in the day and you're super tired or you just don't read very quickly or if you're dyslexic like me and it takes you some extra time. Okay, so you still have the same amount to read. The time it takes is dependent on something else. Same idea here. They still have to get through a certain number of degree hours, but the time it takes is dependent on temperature. Okay, so we can figure out what time it takes from this basic information. So this is all observed information from the life table. Now we just need to do some quick calculations. So we are using our basic degree day, degree hour calculation formula that I have reiterated a million and one times. But just to remind you, it is the average temperature that this insect experiences subtracting out the threshold, that lower threshold, and you times it by a unit of time. So that unit of time helps you determine what you are calculating. If you're using hours, you're calculating degree hours. If you're using days, you're calculating degree days. Like I said in the lessons, uh, you can do degree seconds, degree minutes, degree years, whatever you want. It's just a unit of heat time. Okay, Degree hours and degree days are the most useful though. Uh, so that's what we use. And this is what we tend to get our uh, temperature data in. So we use degree hours and degree days. All right, so remember, average temperature minus a threshold times a unit of time. This is the same exact formula they're going to be using for all of these calculations. Now, I need to input the formula here to do my calculations. This is the number one reason that I use Excel when I am doing any type of calculation like this, because it is so easy to input calculations and then have the computer do the actual math for me. Computers are really, really good at math. You just have to tell them what to do and everything's good to go. What is really nice is if you make a mistake, a typo, or if you're like me and you're dyslexic and you transpose two numbers, this happens to me constantly, something like that. If you set this up correctly, it is really easy to fix mistakes so you don't have to go through and hand calculate things for the rest of your life. That is a recipe for disaster. Okay, so how do you put in a calculation? Step one, you need to tell Excel that you're actually calculating something. The way that you do this is you put in an equals sign. So when you say equals, all you're doing is you're telling Excel, you're telling this program, hey, I'm going to be doing some calculation and I want it to equal this. So this is uh, calculating it. Now I put in my formula. So remember, we got our average temperature minus the threshold times the unit of time. 
So step one is to figure out what the average temperature that these uh, flies experienced during this experiment was. In this case, they were reared at a standard or a stable temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. So remember that you can figure out the average by taking the minimum and the maximum of whatever it is, uh, or the two numbers, and then dividing by two. So in this case, we would take the minimum temperature, add it to the maximum temperature, and divide by two. Since that minimum and the maximum are exactly the same, we're going to end up with an average temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so I start with the parentheses. Now remember your basic math. When you put something in parentheses, that tells you that you need to do that calculation first. So you have to do the same thing here with your um, what you're telling Excel to do. You want it to do this uh, average temperature minus the threshold first. Otherwise, you're going to get some wonky numbers. So I put an open parentheses and I take 25 or just to make it really easy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this area. Now, this is where um, Excel comes in really handy. And like I just said, if I make a mistake, I can change this really easily. So I'm putting in the average temperature here. Now, what happens if I accidentally transpose these numbers or I read this number wrong? What if they weren't actually reared at 25? It was 26 or 35 or something weird there. If I hand entered all the numbers down here, if I uh, made it look you know, something strange, I would have to go back and find where I put in all those numbers and change it if there's a mistake. If I do it this way, where I just put the average temperature right there, and then I simply refer to that cell, then if I make a mistake, I can just fix that cell and it'll automatically update everything. Okay, so what I did there was I opened the parentheses and then I clicked on this cell. You'll see that the uh, letter and the number come up. This refers to the column and the row that that cell is in. So A3 is in column A, row three, and it's that particular cell. So you can either click on it or you can type it in manually. If I wanted to uh, refer to cell A3, I could just put in A3 and it would do the same thing and it would show up right there. So what I'm saying is whatever number is in A3, in this case, it's my average temperature, you wanna take that number and subtract out the threshold temperature. Now this tends to be one that I just type in. I could, if I wanted to, uh, put in a whole other uh, cell that I also refer to, okay? So I could put in another cell and just refer to that one. So I'll show you how to do that in a second. But anyhow, I take the average temperature minus the threshold. Now I need to times by a unit of time. So since we are trying to figure out how many degree hours accumulated, in during this egg stage, I just need to multiply it by this number of hours. So if you are trying to figure out where you're getting that unit of time from, just take a step back and start to think about, okay, what is it I'm trying to actually calculate here? So in this case, I'm trying to calculate how many degree hours were accumulated during the egg stage. Hey, look, there's a unit of time. That must be my unit of time. So when I'm putting this in as a formula, I put multiplies, it's a little asterisk right there. So it's either on your keypad or this should be above, let me find it, uh, eight. So if you put shift eight on your key uh, keyboard, that'll come up with this asterisk. That's just telling this is multiplication and you times it by a unit of time. So again, instead of writing in the, uh, the number here, I just refer to that cell. So in this case, it's B3 column B, row three. I can also type that in. Okay, so now that's my whole formula. So what this is saying is you're gonna take the number that's in A3, so 25 minus the threshold. You're gonna do that first and then you're gonna times or multiply that answer by the number that is in B3, so that unit of time. So when I quit, click enter here, it's gonna do that, that calculation for me. See how seamless that was? Cool. Okay, now, Really quick, uh, like I said before, you can either type in the numbers or you can refer to different cells. So let's say I wanted to um, put in my threshold over here, okay? So I can just put in my threshold number here or better yet, let's do it this way. So let's see, the threshold is going to be six. So I just put the threshold right there. So if I wanted to, I could do the same calculation equals can actually hit equals correctly, equals my average temperature minus my threshold times a unit of time. So let's say egg stage. 
calculates it right there. Now, what's nice about doing it this way is again, if I make a mistake, let's say I misread this 25. Instead, it is 35. Oh God, uh, now I have to go find where I put it all uh, in all these different calculations. Instead, I can just go to the cell that I referred to and change it to 35. Boom. And notice that everywhere that I used it automatically uh, updated that calculation because it's referring to a cell. So whatever number I put in here, boom, it's going to update that calculation. I can do the same thing with the threshold over here. Let's say I misread the threshold or I found a, a paper that is different. I can put in a new threshold and it'll change it over and over and over again. See how that works? Now notice on this one, it only changed this one because this one, remember, I typed in that number. Yeah. So if I find new data and I typed in the number instead of referring to a different cell, uh, that's when I, I have to go in and fix it. Okay. So that's how I do that one. So let's do that here. So change this back to the real numbers. Reared at 25 degrees Celsius. The threshold should be six. And times it by a unit of time. Okay. Now, uh, so I've got this. Now I need to do this for each one of these because what this is telling me is that from the beginning of the egg stage to the end of the egg stage, Chrysomy megacephalin needs 190 degree hours in order to make that development happen. So if it has less than that, then it's still going to be in the egg stage. Once it has more than that, once it reaches that minimum 190, it's going to move into the first instar. So now we know that. Now this is where things get really um, easy and nice. Okay. Where, if I want to um, change a, uh, or I want to do this calculation for a whole bunch of things in a row, I can do this neat little thing where I just drag stuff. Okay, so what you want to do is if you see this cell right here, it's, you can see it's highlighted, but in the bottom right hand corner, there's this tiny little box. If I click uh, on that, left click on it and hold and I drag this, it's basically copying that exact same formula that I put in here into all these other cells. Now, you'll notice these things look a little weird. This is because all it's doing is it's copying this and then it's just moving it over by one cell. Okay, so in this case, I, I want it to be uh, the cell that's kitty corner there and the cell that's above it there. Good. Now, if I look at this one, you'll see, let's get rid of that. All it's doing, and if you double click, it'll show you what it's, it's saying. It's saying that it's um, referring to this one. So that's what the average temperature should be. And this would be time is a unit of time. So since I don't want that, I just need to change this. Okay, so what I can do here is I'm trying to tell it what the average temperature is. So this should be referring to A3, not B3. So all you can do is if you click on this uh, cell, it'll tell you which ones are highlighted. I can just click on the edge of this highlighted cell and drag it to where I want it. And it'll change it. And then I click enter and I'm good to go. Okay, so I just do that for all of those. Send it back there. Okay. All of those. This needs to go back here. So this way I'm actually calculating the average temperature minus a threshold times a unit of time. Now, again, I do it this way simply because it means that I can easily go in and change things. You can, if you want to, you can do the exact same thing where if instead of typing in or having it referred to cells, you can just type in uh, the 25, say. So equals 25 minus six multiplied by unit of time. And that makes the dragging really easy. So you'll see it's the exact same calculation. But instead of referring to the uh, temperature cell, I'm just typing that in. Okay. So also, since 25 minus 6 isn't going to change, you can just figure out what that is and put that number in and that'll be pretty simple. Whatever way you want to do it will work. Just know what you're doing there. Okay. So now I have calculated the number of degree hours that each stage takes. Since most of my data for my temperature data in real life, like for the uh, uh, temperature data outside is in days instead of hours, I need to change this from degree hours to degree days. 
So how do you change hours into days? Well, think about it for a minute, right? Let's say I tell you you've got 48 hours to do something. How do you know how many days that is? You simply take those number of hours and divide by 24. That tells you 48 hours is two days. 72 hours is three days. 96 hours is four days. And, and that's how it works. Okay. So what I can do here is put in degree days. So all I have to do now is I need to take my degree hours and divide by 24. So again, I can do my equal sign and then I'm going to refer to whatever this number is. So the uh, uh, cell right above it, the degree hours, and then you put this little slash and that's the division symbol. And then you put in 24. So what I'm telling the computer here is I need you to calculate whatever is in this cell this box right here and divide it by 24. Then again, you hit enter. And now the degree days are 7.916667. Now I like personally using um, two significant figures. Uh, so just basically two numbers after that decimal point, because this could go on forever, uh, forever and ever. So what you can do here is you can actually uh, uh, format the cells. So if you highlight the cells you want to format, so if I want to uh, highlight a whole column, I click on the letter of the column there. If I want to highlight a whole row, I click on those rows. If I want to highlight the entire uh, sheet, I can click on this little uh, triangle up at the left here. Uh, if I want to drag for more than one column, I will click here and hold and then drag however far I want. So since I want to do all these columns, you can do that and then I'll right click over that highlighted thing and you'll see this little uh, right click menu comes up click on format cells so what this is saying is this is now telling excel what type of numbers we're using so general is usually your standard just this is whatever i decide to put in if it's a number it'll ask you for the number of decimal places you want to use so that's what i want to do i want to tell it this is a, a number not just a, a word or something like that and when they see a number, I want to use two decimal places after that decimal point. So you can change this. You can do three or four or five or a million or whatever you want to do or zero or whatever. And this will round up or round down according to your normal rounding rules. OK, so since I want to use two, um, then I can click OK. Now, if I wanted to use other things, so you have a whole bunch of other stuff here. You can change it to a date, to a time, a percentage, a fraction, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stuff you can do here. It's a really powerful program. But I want to use two decimal places. So you just click number, tell the number of decimal places you want. And notice everything changes into two decimal places. So if it's a, if it's a zero after it, it'll be two. If it's uh, more decimal places, it'll round according to your basic rounding rules. OK, so done that now i want i need to calculate the degree days for every single other column instead of typing things in again though i can just click on this bottom right hand corner of this cell that little box and drag and it'll do this calculation now i do like spot checking just to make sure i'm actually doing the correct calculation so what i did there was if i uh highlight a uh, a cell with a calculation in it and if you go up to the top here this gives you a lot of room on exactly what you are looking at or wh what's going on in that cell so if i click somewhere in that uh formula it'll show me what is highlighted so what this is saying is like okay to figure out the degree days i took this number of degree hours divided by 24. yep that's exactly what i want now when you have it highlighted like this though you have to be careful you don't want to click anywhere else instead click enter and that will uh, close that out without changing that formula. So you can just double check everything here. And yep, it looks all good. This is an easy way to find if there's a mistake. If something just isn't making sense, make sure that the formulas are actually doing what they're supposed to do. OK, so now I've got my degree days. So now this is telling me that I need 190 degree hours to go through the egg stage and 7.92 degree days, 228 hours to go from the uh, beginning of the first instar to the end of the first instar or 9.5 degree days, 418 or 17.42 for the second instar, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we're doing here. So when you see questions, if I'm asking you how many degree hours or degree days uh, are accumulated just in the first instar, uh, without the egg stage, without anything else, this is what I'm asking for, these numbers here. It's a way for me to spot check that you're actually doing these formula correctly. But 
in the real world, when I'm actually using this to figure out a time of colonization estimation, I'm not going to be using just these uh, numbers. Instead, it's an accumulation. You can't get to the first instar without first going through the egg stage. You can't get to the second instar without going through the egg and the first instar. It's all cumulative there. So what I have to do is I now have to add these up. So instead of being discrete stages, I now add them up. So this is how I like doing it because it just works with the way that my brain works. So what I say is I say this is going to be the end of the egg, of the, uh, egg stage. Uh, this is going to be the end of the first instar. This is going to be the end of the second instar, end of third, end of pre pupae and the end of pupae. Because what this is telling me is that whatever number, the number of degree days or degree hours that is here, that's how many degree days it takes to get to the very end of that egg stage. Then the very end of the first instar is if that insect had gone through the egg and then the, uh, the entire first. And then the end of the second means egg first and then all the way to the end of the second before they get to third. End of third, egg first, second, and all the way to the end of third, etc. Okay, so this way I now will be able to figure out a range like we talked about in lecture. So what I do here then is the end of the egg stage is just whatever the degree hours are there or the degree day. So let's say I want to do degree days since I mostly work in degree days. So I just put the degree days um, here and I call these accumulated degree days or ADD. Accumulated means several stages in a row. So it's accumulated over time. Okay, so ADD there. Now, in this case, if I just want to refer back to whatever number is in a different cell, you can do that really easily in Excel. You just put equals and then you click on that cell. So since I want the degree days for the eggs, I just click that and I hit enter and it'll just move that number down there. Now, anytime I change this number here, then it'll also change it here because I'm just referring back to that uh, original cell. So this makes it really easy. If I change numbers elsewhere, it'll make sure that everything else changes too. Okay, now that one was super simple. Now I need to start adding things. So what I need to do here is to get to the end of the first instar, I need to add the egg stage plus all the degree days that have accumulated in that first instar stage. So in this case, it's just adding. So I put in equals and then I'll say equals that. So that's the full egg stage plus uh, what I accumulated here in the first instar. That plus that, press enter. Now that's 7.92 plus 9.5, which is 17.42. So now I know that to get to the end of the first instar, Megacephala has to uh, experience 17.42 uh, degree days. However quickly that happens, that's what they need in order to get to the end of the first instar. And then I just keep doing that. Okay, so then I take equals and the first instar, remember that's egg plus first instar, and then I add what happened in the second instar. Boom. Cool. So I just keep doing that. Now, I can at this point grab this uh, thing and drag and it should give me some nice additive data. But again, you can go and double check. So in this case, I am adding end of second to that third. Yep, that looks right. In this case, I'm adding end of uh, third here to the pre-pupae. Yep, that looks right. There we go. To the pupae, cool. So what this is now saying is, uh, now I know how long it takes to get to the end of each one of these stages. Nice. So if I wanted to know how many degree days it takes for megacephala to go from uh, the being fully oviposited all the way to the very end of their pupil stage, I just look at this. It takes them 176 degree days. If I wanted to know how long it took them in degree days or how many degree days it took them to get to the end of the third instar, bam, there it is. 70.46 degree days. End of pre-pupil, 98.6 degree days. So this allows us to create our range. So go back to those lessons where I talked about those ranges of uh, degree days and why we use them. But when I uh, say range, I'm usually looking for uh, the beginning of one stage to the end of that stage. So let's say I found some third instar maggots on a body. I identified them. They're Chrysomyia megacephala. Hey, so Chrysomyia megacephala, third instar maggots are on this dead body. How many degree days are, are necessary 
for those maggots to get into that observed stage. Remember that I have no idea where in that third instar they're at. They could have just uh, molted into that third instar. They could be just about ready to head into the pre-pupil stage. They're somewhere in there. There's no way of me knowing, but I do know that they're in the third instar. So I need my range. So my range then is going to last from the end of the second instar. So this is that they've gone all the way through the second instar and they're in the act of molting to the end of the third instar. Okay, so then in this case, the range is simply going to be 34.83 to 70.46. So this is going from the end of the second. So they're just starting the third to the end of the third. You can kind of think about this like um, figuring out uh, where in the year somebody is on their birthday. So like I'm 44 now, right? My birthday is in July. Okay, I can tell you I'm 44. You don't know necessarily where I'm at in my uh, 44th year unless you know exactly when my birthday is, right? So I can say I'm 44. You don't know, am I like 44 and one second because I just had my birthday? Or am I 44 years old and six months? Am I 44 years old and nine and a half months? Am I uh, just about ready to turn 45 because my birthday is in two minutes? It's, it's just about happening. Where am I in there? I just say I'm 44. That's the exact same way that we say they're third in star. We don't know exactly where they are. So it's basically when I tell you I'm 44, I'm giving you a year long range. Okay. I'm 44 years old. That could be a, some unknown number of minutes and seconds in there. But unless you know the exact minute of my birth, then you won't know where I'm at. Same exact thing here. We're just basically trying to get the full year range or the full uh, instar range here. So that's all we're doing. So let's say I found third instar. What I need to know is the end of the second to the end of the third. If uh, they experience more degree days, then they'd be in the end of the pre-pupil. If they experience fewer they'd be in the first or the second in star. So that's where we get our range from. Now, when I figure out what that range is, I like doing highlights a lot. So in this case, I will highlight with yellow, this is my range. So the end of the second to the end of the third. So in order to uh, see these megacephala in the third in star on that dead body, they had to have experienced somewhere between 34.83 and 70.46 degree days. If they experienced more, we'd see them in a different stage. If they experienced fewer, we'd see them in a younger stage. So that's what we're looking for. Okay, so that was the first big thing you needed to do is figure out how many degree days were needed to get to an observed stage of these insects. So now I've got my table. So my second step then is to try to apply this to time. So what you have to do here is now you need to figure out how many degree days happened in the world. So how many degree days happened outside where this dead body was? So you know how long in time it took these insects to reach this observed stage. So either you need to go and look this stuff up on a weather app or, or somewhere like that, or I've given you the weather data whatever information you have, you basically need a max and min temperature for every day. So let's take this. Let's say we found the dead body on March 21st right here, right? Okay. Or, or we found on March 27th, my bad. Okay. So we found it down here on March 27th. Now I work backwards. Okay. When you find data like this, it gives you, you know, this, this forwards way, March 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th. I like to switch it. This is because if I am looking at a, uh, um, a, a body, I need to know when in the past this body was available for colonization. Again, think about it like your birthday. If I tell you I'm 44 years old today, you should be able to figure out the, the year of my birth, right? So if it was a 2020, all you need to do is count backwards 44 years and you can figure out what year I was born. If I told you I was 30 in 2020, you would count backwards and you would figure out what year I was born. So that's why I work backwards. Instead of years though, we're doing days. So if we found a body on March 27th and I need to know what day it was placed outside, I just need to count days backwards. And I can do that by figuring out how old these maggots are. So if I figure out that they're three days old, I can just count backwards from March uh, 27th, one to three days. And now we've got March 24th when it was available for colonization. So I work backwards. But when you first get this temperature data, it's in this normal time, it's going forward. So you have to flip it. Okay, so what I do here is then I just transcribe this data. Okay, so I make a new table here and I put the date and I will put the minimum 
in Fahrenheit and the max in Fahrenheit. So always remember to label things because this is where mistakes can happen. Okay, so now uh, let's say the body was found on March 22nd, 27th, 27th. So I put the date here. Okay. And notice that this changed it to uh, a, uh, an easy way to do March 27th. This is just how I like seeing my dates on my calendar. If I wanted to change this, I could again highlight what uh, things I wanted to change and right click and click format cells. And you can click on date here and you can change it to whatever you want. I could say Wednesday. I could say uh, I want it to be uh, in this manner, you know, the 12 or the 12.3 to uh, 14 or whatever. Okay. So you can choose whatever way you want your date to look. If this is up to you. Okay. This is just the standard I have set up. I forget what the, um, uh, normal standard is. So you can change it however you want. Okay. So this is what I like looking at. Okay. Now, since I'm going backwards here, I have to show the, uh, computer that I have a pattern here. So March 26th. So now I've got two dates in a row. To show the software a, a pattern, you need at least two data points. Because once you have two data points, then the software can sort of make its own logical leap and saying, oh, we're, we're counting backwards now in dates that can do that. The reason that I do this is because now I don't have to hand type everything in. Again, I will highlight both of these and then I will click this uh, bottom right hand um, corner with a little box and I will drag and it will uh, fill in all these different dates for me. So I don't have to do a lot of typing. Love that. Okay. You can see it comes up on that little box to the right there. So I can go as far as I want. So I've got data from March 27th to March 21st. So I'll just do that. Uh, March 21st. Now, the reason I have to put in two data points there is because again, you have to tell the computer what you want it to do. It can't read your mind totally. It's got some standard things in the background that's going to do if you don't tell it any information. So let's say I put in March 27th here and I want to drag again. If I were just to drag here, it's going to go forward in time. So 28, 29, 30th. That's just what normally people are looking for. So that's what its standard is doing. So if I, if I want it to go backwards, I have to put two data points there. So that's all. Okay, so let's delete that or clear contents is the easiest way. So put in two data points and you can drag. This makes it super easy if you're dealing with many, many, many days. Uh, I can't tell you how exhausting it is to have to type in, you know, 200 days by hand. That's just a pain in the ass and I don't want to. So dragging is big. Now, this is what you do have to enter in by hand since this is given to you. So in this case, I'm just going to hand enter these data points. So we got 45. 74. Okay. So I'm just gonna fast forward and do this really quick. All right. That's all done for you now. Uh, if you want to go from column to column, you can just hit tab and that'll tab you along the columns. You can also hit next arrow or things like that. If you want to go row to row, you just hit enter and then I'll go row to row or you can hit the up and down arrows as well. Okay. Now, Notice that this has two decimal places over that. Remember a few minutes ago when I uh, formatted all these cells? So these cells are formatted to be numbers. Since I don't really want that, I can go in and highlight these things and reformat this. Now this is stuff you don't necessarily have to do. You can just um, leave it as a normal number, uh, whatever you want to do. Uh, it just bugs me when I have decimal places when I'm not using decimals. So there. If I was given decimal points for these temperatures, then I would, I would leave those decimals. This is just a little pet peeve and I just like it looking pretty. So you can do whatever you want there. So I've just changed it now. Now I can figure out the average temperature again. So remember to figure out an average temperature since I have a max and a min, I'm able to figure out average. So I always put average in Fahrenheit up here. So again, you're going to hit equal. Now Excel has a whole bunch of different formula already uh, included in it. And so there's all manner of different calculations it can just do for you. Averages is one of them. So all you have to do is put in the uh, name of the formula you want it to use. In this case, it's called average. So you take average. Now notice as I started typing, this little box underneath here came up. So this gives you all your different formula types. And as I started, these are all the different formula that start with A. 
school. So if I just type in average, you can click that, and this little pop-up right here will give you a little bit of information about that. Okay, so once I click that, now I've said average, then you need to put in parentheses. And again, notice this little box that clicked up right here. This will tell you what to do next. So all you have to do here is refer to different cells in order to uh, tell, tell the uh, computer which numbers you want to average. So in this case, I want to average this one. And notice here, it gives you how to put the formula in. So then you put a comma and then click on the next cell and hit enter and that'll now average this for you. Another way I can do that is average, open parentheses, and then I can click and drag across a list of cells. See how it shows up here? This tells you B11 colon uh, C11. So this is saying, this is gonna average all the numbers between these two cells. If I had uh, a big long list here, let's say I went all the way up to M11. So again, it's the column and the thing. So I could change that. M11, and you see how it's automatically highlighted this whole way? Cool. So this is giving the average number between B11 and M11, all these cells there. So that's just a little trick on how to do that. Okay, and then you click enter, and it's going to do that for you. Cool. Now, uh, what's nice about this, again, is once you put in that formula once, you can just drag all the way down so you don't have to type it a thousand times. And all this is going to do is average these cells, the cells right next to it. So again, you can go through and spot check. Yep, that looks right. Next one. Yep, that looks right. Yep, that looks right. So now we've got the average for each one of these. And see how fast that was? Oh, so nice. Now again, this makes it very easy because I had to type all these numbers in. Let's say I accidentally mistyped this one day and the, uh, the uh, minimum threshold wasn't 45. It was 55. So I can go through there and it'll automatically change that calculation. So that makes it really nice. Okay, so now I've got my averages. Now what I need to do is figure out how many degree days and degree hours have happened during this time. However, I need to do one step first. I need to make sure that I'm working in the same temperature data in both of these sets. So in science, we use uh, Celsius or centigrade on a regular basis, it just makes calculations easy. When you pull down temperature data though, you will often get it in Fahrenheit if you're in the US. So I need to change Fahrenheit to Celsius. You can do that by going and Googling it, you can do it by hand, or you can just let the computer do its work and change it for you. Again, this is why Excel rules. So I put at uh, the top of here, so just to remind myself what I'm doing, so in this case, so I did that backwards. I'm changing Fahrenheit to Celsius. And again, there is a, a formula that you can use called convert. So in this case, you put equals and you're going to use the formula convert, V-E-R-T. So see how convert comes up right here? So it says converts a number from one measurement system to another. That makes it really easy. Good. So now you put open parentheses and it tells you exactly what you need to do here. So in this case, you're gonna convert the number. So if you were to click on that, I want to convert whatever is in this cell, the cell directly to the left at the average Fahrenheit. So you click that. And if you look at how this looks, it's got, you have to have the number, then you hit a comma. And then you have to tell the computer what are the units this is in. And you have to put those units in parentheses. So it'll come up with a whole bunch of different common units. We've got our grams, a slug, whatever that is, grain for um, bullets. Uh, you can have inches and feet and yards and hours and days and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So it's just all these different things that you can use. Okay. So you can go through here and try to find Fahrenheit. Uh, these are the most common ones. It may or may not be on here, or you can just put open parentheses F because that's Fahrenheit and then close parentheses. So what I've said here is now this is in Fahrenheit. Then you put another comma, open parentheses, and notice it came up like, oh, you're doing Fahrenheit. You'll probably want to convert it to Celsius or to Kelvin or something. Yeah, Celsius. So I can either click here and it'll do it for me, or I can put open parentheses or open uh, uh, parentheses is that parentheses? Oh, quotes. Jeez, what am I saying? Open quotes. C, close quotes, right? Okay, and then I put close parentheses and it calculates it for me. Okay, so this is what it looks like then. Okay, so it's it's going to be 
convert, open parentheses, the cell you want to convert, comma, open quotes, Fahrenheit, close quotes, comma, open quotes, Celsius, close quotes, close parentheses. Okay, now, this can be a little bit of a pain in the butt to try to remember. What is really, really nice is every time you uh, start to put in convert, it'll have that little pop up that helps you out. Or you can go to Google and say convert F to C or convert Fahrenheit to Celsius in Excel. And a million resources will come up like videos telling you exactly how to do it or a step by step thing on WikiHow or whatever else. There's all manner of resources on Google. So for whatever formula you want to do, if you have a formula you want to be able to do in Excel, somebody has made a video about it. Neat. OK, so do that now. Now that I've done it here again, I can just drag and convert everything. Oh, so easy. And then just do a quick spot check. Yep, it's converting everything correct rad. So now I see that my uh, Fahrenheit has been converted to Celsius and now I'm in uh, 15 degrees Celsius on average or 15.28, 18.06, etc, etc, etc. Done and done. Now I need to figure out the accumulated degree days. I can't do degree hours here. This is because you can't convert degree days to degree hours. You can convert degree hours to degree days because it's going from very precise to less precise. You can't go from less precise to more precise because that's going to give you some false positives. So you can't do that. So we are, have to be working in degree days. So what I do is I do that same exact formula. Your average temperature minus your threshold times a unit of time. So we have an average temperature here. Great. It's in Celsius. That's our average for that day. Now, what is our threshold that we are using? You want to use the threshold temperature for whatever species of fly you happen to be calculating for. So in this case, it's megacephala. We know that our threshold is six, six degrees Celsius. Okay. Because that's given to you. Uh, if I was doing this for a real case, I would go and find this information in the, um, in the literature, but here we are. So it's six degrees Celsius. So we take our average temperature minus a threshold times a unit of time. So what I'm calculating here is how many degree days happened on every day. So in that case, we're just looking at a, a unit of time of one day. So our unit of time is one. So in this case, we again, just put in our calculations. So in this case, we got average temperature. So that is this minus our threshold, which is six times a unit of time, oops, average temperature times, not plus, times one. Now, since times one, I mean, that's a really easy calculation to do, right? I don't even have to put that in there because it's just going to be whatever the number is, but just so you can see, I'm doing the full calculation. Average temperature minus a threshold times my one day, hit enter. Now we know that 9.28 degree days accumulated on March 27th. Can you guess what I'm going to do next? I'm going to drag. So I take this, I click and I drag all the way down. And now it's done the calculations for every single day. Yay. So that is that average, that average, that average, that average. So now I know how many degree days have accumulated on any given day. So if I want to know how many degree days accumulated just on March 23rd, 9.83. So you may see in some of your quizzes, I may ask, Okay, you have this temperature data. How many degree days accumulated just on March 22nd? Not uh, over time, just on that one day. This is what I'm asking for. I'm asking to see this number. The answer for that one is 14. If I ask for March 21st, it would be 16.78. There you go. So that's what I'm asking for. This is how many degree days accumulated on each day. But again, we have to do an add up. We have to do a sum just like we did here because we're looking for accumulated degree days, not just degree days. So then I have one more column called ADD, accumulated degree days. In this case, I have to add things together. So this is the way that I do it simply because it works well in Excel. So if I was doing this by hand, I would simply add 9.28 plus 12.06 plus 9.28, et cetera, all the way down. Okay. To make it easy here, what I do is first I need to get this one day. So this is the day that we found the body. March 27th, 9.28 degree days accumulated there. So that's just where we're starting. So I can just put an equal sign again and click on this uh, cell and that'll just move that number over here. Now, the reason I do it this way is if I need to change something down here. So again, let's say I did the calculation wrong. Look how everything changes. Oh, so easy. 
So I can fix any typos and things will automatically update. Now, if I were to drag at this point, all this would be doing though is just moving uh, this number and copying it over into this next column because that's all I told the com computer to do so far. But I don't want to do that. Instead, I want to start adding the uh, what these accumulated degree days are with that number before it. Okay, so in order to figure this out, I want to add March 27th, 26th. Then I want to add March 27th, 26th, 25th. Then 27th, 26th, 25th, 24th. So I want to do that all the way down. Okay, so what I do here is then I just do a sum. So this will equal, and then I click on the number of degree days for that previous day, hit plus, and then I do the number right above it because that's the sum of what has come before it. And then I hit enter. So now this is... Uh, 9.6 or 9.28 plus 12.06. So that's how many degree days have happened over both of those days. Now on the second one, I can drag and drop because again, I'm telling the computer, I want you to add uh, together the cell to my left and the cell right above me. And that'll be my running total. So then I can drag and drop and you'll notice it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so this is, so if I were to say, look at March 23rd here, this number is the sum of the uh, all of the degree days that have accumulated on the 27th, the 26th, 25th, 24th, and the 23rd. And that's why it looks like that. The day before, it's the 27th, 26th, 25th, 24th, 23rd, and 22nd, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do this forever. All right, so now I have a running total. Okay, so now I know how many degree days have accumulated over time on any given day and then over time. So. All I need to do now is compare how many I need to how many I have. Cool. So in this case, I now need to find my range. So the lower end of my range, so remember this is back here. This is the end of the second instar, very beginning of the third instar, all the way to the end of the third instar for megacephala, because say we saw third instar maggots. So what this is saying is that on March 27th, I found a body. It had third instar uh, chrysomyia megacephala maggots on it. Great. So now I need to figure out how old they are in time. So I've done all my calculations. Now I just need to find these numbers. So my lower uh, edge, the lower end of my range is 34.83 degree days. So all I need to do is go through my accumulated degree day column and find when, it, when I meet that range. So March 27th, not nearly enough degree days have accumulated on this one day. So what this is telling me is that if the body died this morning, if that person was killed this morning, or like went one minute past midnight on March 27th. There is not enough time in that day, not enough degree days were accumulated in that day for those maggots to reach the third instar. So that person could not have been available for colonization only on March 27th. They couldn't have been alive the day before because there's not enough time for the maggots to reach that uh, developmental stage. So I have to go to the day before. So if they died on March 26th and experienced all that, they would have experienced 21.33 degree days. Again, not enough. They would have been much younger if that was the case. So let's go one more day back, the 30, or the March 25th. So they only experienced 30 degree days. That's getting closer, but not enough. They would still be in their second instar if that is when they died. So we have to go back one more day. Ah, oh, there it is. So that is over the 34.83. That is plenty of time for them or uh, plenty of uh, degree days for them to reach that third in star. Okay, so this is the end of second. So I know here, and again, I will highlight this so I make it real easy for me to see. So if we saw these maggots and they ended up be at the very end of their second, the very beginning of their third in star, then uh, that body had to have been available for colonization on March 24th. But since we don't know where they are in that third instar, maybe they're just about ready to go pre-pupil, I need to find that upper end. So now I keep going. So let's see. 47.2. Nope, that's not it. 61. Ah, 78. There it is. So here's my end of third. So in order for these maggots to be in the third instar, that body had to have been dead and out in the, in the world, ready for flies to come lay eggs on it, somewhere between March 21st and March 24th. So then my time of colonization estimation is March 23rd or 21st through March 24th. There we go. That person had to have been dead then. So what this will tell me, and when this becomes really important, is things like 
uh, somebody said they saw that decedent. They saw the dead person on the morning of March 27th. Given the insects, that's not possible. They saw somebody else. Unless something weird is happening where somebody dumped a bunch of third instars on them, there's no way that person could have been alive on March 27th because the maggots would have been much younger. Or they can say, well, this person insisted they killed the person on oh, February 1st. No way we'd be seeing third instar maggots if that person was killed on um, February 1st and available for colonization on that same day. So then we can say, well, did you keep that person in the freezer or something? And if the uh, person who's trying to convince says, no, I killed them outside and they left them there. No, no way in hell. Nope, didn't happen. And we know that because of this information. They had to have been available for colonization between these dates in order for these maggots to get to this stage of um, development. So that is how you do these calculations with Excel. I hope this helps. Let me know if you have any questions.